So there was a, this got a lot of attention. You guys may have heard about Abbott has this little machine uh, where they're taking a blood sample, I mean, a, a swab sample. They're putting it in a little container here and they're gonna be able to run the PCR test to see if the RNA is present, uh, saying someone has a diagnosis. They're talking about a five to 15 minute turnaround time. Uh, that sounds great, uh, but this is, this is the kind of thing that you'd find in a, you know, in a private office where they're doing a strep test or a flu test. This is not, you can't test hundreds or thousands of people. I mean, this, you, you'd have to wait 15 minutes per person to do a test. So even though this sounds exciting, it really is not uh, the machine that we're gonna need right now where we really need a great input and a throughput of doing hundreds or thousands of, of tests at a time. So this will be interesting in, in the physician's office, but really not help us uh, that much uh, or we're trying to get a, a, a grasp on this uh, horrible uh, epidemic going on. So that was, that's a little bit. There is a test made uh, uh, that is uh, going to be about 45 minutes. Uh, it'll be similar to this, but it will actually be able to uh, run in the hospital labs and uh, give us more testing ability. Next slide. So. The question is really comes up, how many patients are really asymptomatic? And may they, uh, do they, are they, are they attributing the, those symptoms to something else or do they really have symptoms to infection? And so are people really asymptomatic? And you know, one thing that was just published about a week ago was the findings that up to about 30% of patients may actually have a loss of smell called anosmia as their only presenting complaint. Some may have this as their only symptom, uh, or some may go on to get symptoms. So somebody may say, oh, my nose is stuffed up. I just can't smell anything. It may actually be a symptom of this disease. So some people that are supposedly asymptomatic may actually not appreciate that this as a cause of it. But many who are initially without symptoms, the time of diagnosis will later go on to have complaints. And so the question, are these patients that are asymptomatic who uh, PCR test is positive, are they really uh, still infectious? And so they had a study where they looked at 55 patients who, uh, who remained asymptomatic throughout their infection. And they did CT scans of these patients who felt perfectly well. But over two thirds of these patients had abnormal CT scans of the lungs when so they actually had active infection. And uh, so just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean that you don't have an active infection and that you may be contagious. And so if you look at this next study, this just was published yesterday uh, by the Centers for Disease Control. And they wanted to do a, a rigorous look at, is it true somebody who is pre-symptomatic, who is asymptomatic, actually can, trans can transmit this virus? And so they looked at, uh, they took the Singapore group, they had 167 patients who they felt were locally acquired. It wasn't somebody had just returned from uh, China or Europe and had the infection, but they found people that had no evidence of travel, and they were able to uh, look at who they've been exposed to. And they want to know, did any of these patients who developed the infection, had they been exposed to asymptomatic uh, infected people? So does, it, does pre-symptomatic transmission, defined as uh, transmitting the virus when you have no symptoms, can that actually occur? And so the, the CDC and the, and the scientists in Singapore were able to identify seven clusters of cases one in a church, one in a family unit. And they found in 10 of these cases of the 167, they felt very comfortable that they had documented infection of the virus to another person before the onset of their symptoms. So this obviously has implications for the public health intervention. Uh, and we'll talk about it, but you'll see, what's interesting about this uh, virus compared to like the SARS and, and the MERS, uh, those are also coronavirus infections, but they found out that, for example, the SARS people did not transmit the virus until they were very sick. And so it was easy with the SARS patients, they get sick, you put them in the hospital, you isolate it, and you could stop the transmission. But what makes this COVID-19 so nasty is that we seem to be having evidence that you don't have to have symptoms and you become infected. So this, this has a lot of public health uh, implications. So I'm gonna give you an example one, this was a cluster they called cluster B, and I'll show you the slide. This was a woman age 54. She had attended a dinner event on February 15th, 
It turned out she was exposed to a patient at that dinner event who went on to have confirmed COVID-19. So nine days later, she and another woman, a second patient who was age 63, attended the same singing class. And two days later, the first woman, the one who was exposed to somebody who had the COVID-19, became symptoms. And then the second woman uh, de uh, developed it a few days later. So if you look at the next slide, this is uh, from the paper. So cluster B, patient one, she's exposed right here to somebody who turns out to have the virus. She meets up patient two at a singing class. Uh, she feels fine, but must be aerosolizing the virus. And they both, this woman gets exposed. Two days later, she has the onset of her symptoms, cough, headache, and myalgia. And just a few days later, uh, this lady becomes sick. So they have these multiple cases, clusters, which seems to be, they felt there was no other explanation. There's no other exposure, no other reason. They, they analyzed these patients very carefully. So they felt they're documenting, while not the most common cause of transmission, asymptomatic patients, or people would think they're asymptomatic, and certainly transmit the virus. Next slide, please. So how, do, how, how can we apply this to prevent transmission in hospitals and skilled facilities? So obviously, if we had a rapid testing available where everybody could be tested, we could, we could act uh, uh, we could check everybody, but at this point, we really have to assume that everybody's infected until we can prove otherwise. So there's been a lot of research looking at, oh, people, you know, you get it from your Amazon box or things like that, but uh, or on your clothes, but they've looked pretty carefully at this, and there's not that much in, uh, uh, documented cases that this called fomite transmission. It all seems to be from droplet transmission between people uh, where they get exposed to it, uh, and then they uh, touched her eye, nose, or mouth on the mucous membranes. But we have evidence now that asymptomatic carriers are passing it on. And so this is really how COVID-19 uh, is so much different than the other outbreaks. So what we have, I think is important is that everybody who works in a hospital should be wearing a mask, okay? You don't wanna wait till you have symptoms uh, because I could, particularly in a small hospital, even though if you're asymptomatic, you can uh, take out like half your medical department and be very, very, uh, uh, be very disaster for the hospital. So, you know, uh, I think that we have to be very concerned about this asymptomatic transmission. And so particularly where, you know, if we had the, the machines to do this, uh, people that work in skilled nursing facilities, I think it's really important for them to wear a mask. And if you have the the possibility of, uh, if any of them are positive, uh, the whole skilled facility, uh, the patients themselves should also be, be uh, scanned. So I recommend everyone should be wearing masks, social distancing in the facility. You really want to restrict visitors, even though they feel fine, and enforce strict hand wash. So I think, I think this is why we're seeing so much of, uh, of this, this problem. So I just want to review and present a case of how do you differentiate a cold versus the flu versus the coronavirus? So a cold, runny nose, sneezing, is very untypical for that to be a COVID-19 or flu presentation. As you know, the flu oftentimes has a sudden onset. People feel like they got hit by a Mack truck, fever, et cetera. But in contrast, the COVID virus really has about a prodromal syndrome. Myalgias, cough, patient may not, may or not sure that they're feeling more feeling well. The fever may or may not occur. It takes really about a, a week uh, of these symptoms before they, they progress to the point where they get shortness of breath and, and need, need hospitalization. Next. So the most common presentation we see of people hospitalized is this one-week program, myalgias, cough, low-grade fevers, gradually progressing to the onset of severe trouble breathing. And that's usually where they present at the hospital. It usually takes about eight days to before you develop the dyspnea, which is the involvement of the lung by this infection, symptomatic involvement by the coronavirus. For about nine days before you really see x-ray findings and pneumonia pneumonitis. And the big labs to look for are lymphopenia, elevated liver enzymes, and a normal tetra While you may not have any of these symptoms and the patient is infected, uh, certainly it should uh, set off a light bulb in your head. That, that's what you may be dealing with. Next one, please. So the most consistent finding in, in the COVID-19 infections is the lymphopenia. 
The neutrophil count can be low, normal, or, or high, but it really doesn't help us. You may see abnormal transaminases. And another marker, if you have a patient where pulmonary infiltrates, but a low procalcitonin uh, means you're maybe uh, dealing with something else in a bacterial infection. A high procalcitonin may mean you have a superimposed bacterial pneumonia, but the procalcitonin is pretty specific for bacterial infections and not viral infections. All right, so abnormal transaminases, lymphopenia is most important, and a low procalcitonin for pulmonary infiltrates. Next. And so this is a slide I showed last time. Basically, the lymphocyte count is also a poor prognostic indicator. So the average we have here in, in black, these are patients that went on to die. Their lymphocyte counts were about 1,400. And over the next five to 10 days, they progressively uh, dropped. And these patients uh, died. In contrast, patients who present also with lymphopenia, but after a few days of their onsets, the lymph lymphocytes start going up again. It's a very encouraging sign that these patients are going to do well. And again, this is actually the antibody test we're talking about. You don't want to order antibody test uh, at the beginning. You want to get the PCR test because the antibody test takes you know about two weeks before it starts kicking in. But it can be useful in retrospective looking at people had they had the disease in the past. Next slide. Charlie, if I could stop us, I do want to get yeah, to some yeah. questions that have come in. Um, question about uh, what's the sensitivity or specificity of testing? Um, would you be able to answer that? Is Dr. Pandora here? I do not see him on with us today, no. All right. That's really not, it's not clear. Uh, some tests are, are different than others. It's how they're, how they are, uh, Acquired, they do the proper, you know, the Dacron uh, uh, Q-tip in the nose properly. The other thing is that uh, definitely uh, the public health department recommends, you know, you be symptomatic for at least a day uh, when you're looking at patients with disease because you maybe have a false negative or you may take one or two tests to turn positive. And their recommendation, if, if the patient seems clinically to have the disease, the first one's negative, repeat it one to two days later and it may improve the sensitivity of the test. Okay. Um, about whether they should be using N95 or just surgical masks? We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Towards the end there, we'll talk about healthcare workers a little bit more. Next. Okay. Um, and then a question about getting the PowerPoint. So these, these slides will be posted on our website later today, um, and I'll send out the link for our website towards the end of the session. Um, a question from Dr. Bayan, is AKI due to pre-renal azotemia or intrinsic injury? Uh, probably intrinsic injury, but a lot of these patients may have been taking ibuprofen and other medicines which could affect their kidney. But it's usually not a significant uh, kidney dysfunction. Okay. Um, how many hospitals and healthcare facilities are using the antibody body test? Body Sphere claims to have an antibody test that will take two minutes to check for IgG and IgM. Any chance this will be readily available at some point? But again, I think you know uh, those are those are after the infections kicked in. You know, the IgM may take seven to ten days to turn positive, and the IgG may take two or three weeks. So it's really a retrospective look at at a patient. Uh, the PCR test is much more sensitive because you're gonna you're not you're gonna have negative antibodies uh, initially. And uh, so you, I think the PCR is the better test to go with at that point. But it's, let's say you don't want to say how many people are out there never had symptoms. It might be done, you know, just for uh, epidemiologic reasons, you may want to check the IgG. Uh, but I would think you're, you're better off starting off with the PCR test. Okay. Uh, Norman Wright shared uh, a data tool, uh, projections of when COVID will peak, how many hospital and ICU beds are available and other information. So if you want that, uh, that link is in the chat box. And then one more question, and then we'll keep going here with the didactic. Uh, do we know if mildly symptomatic COVID patients have symptoms more commonly associated with common cold um, that might be that might confound with common cold? No, I think it's it's a whole spectrum of disease, but it's very unusual to see people sneezing uh, and having just cold symptoms with this disease. Great. Thanks for those questions, everybody. Um, so we'll wrap up the didactic here and then we'll, we'll have some time for more questions. Next. All right. So I just want to review chest x-ray findings. Subtle, but almost always present in ill patients. And if you look at the, 
it's it's a pretty characteristic where they have bilateral what we call patchy just so they're not ground they're not like dense consolidation infiltrates oftentimes on the lateral aspects of each lung and in the setting where a procalcitonin is negative it's very suggestive of this disease there shouldn't be any effusion but it's always this characteristic chest x-ray finding China was using CAT scans to uh, diagnose their patients. They were doing 200 people a day on a CAT scan to look for a more sensitive test, but that's not appropriate because you'd have to, uh, you know, decontaminate the room uh, for an hour or two. You'd have to wear PPEs, and so it's not it's not done here uh, as a part of a standard evaluation. So, one next one. All right, so I'm just going to patient pretty quickly. This is uh, a Middle-aged male who came into the emergency with five-day history of muscle aches, headache, fever, and a non-productive color, cough, and shortness of breath with exertion. And we talked about the risk factors uh, for infection. He had possibly been exposed to a coworker who had this disease diagnosed a week earlier. His own risk factors for uh, poor prognosis uh, were his obesity and his autoimmune condition. What was interesting. He's on Umera and methotrexate for this autoimmune condition, but he's also been on uh, Plaquenil, hydro hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligrams a day, uh, daily for years. Uh, he was short of breath. He had a fever. His heart rate was tachycardic. His Y count was 4,000, sort of normal. His lymphocyte count was 1,000, which a few months earlier had been 2,700, so it was somewhat low for him. His creatinine was normal. His transaminases were normal. His pro-cal was negative. And so it made a bacterial infection unlikely. Next slide. So over here, it's sort of somewhat hard to see, but this is his heart, and these are his lungs. He's somewhat overweight, so, but there are no infiltrates at all seen on the CAT scan. It was red as clear. At the same time, they were concerned about uh, the COVID infection, so he had a CAT scan. And so this is looking at his lungs. You can see bilateral, these are the lungs on both sides. He's got Patchy infiltrates bilaterally with a normal procalcitonin with these symptoms. Very suggestive and classic findings for uh, the COVID-19. You say, oh, then they should have done a CAT scan. They should do a CAT scan. But, you know, the, his symptoms were so classic for it uh, that, I mean, this is interesting, but it really was not necessary. But at this point, they added the COVID test and it became positive. Next. But it's interesting. He developed this wall on Plaquenil. So he's put in the ICU. Uh, they stopped his uh, Umera and his methotrexate. They left him on the uh, the Plaquenil, the, the uh, and he was uh, given oxygen. His total lymphocyte count day three dropped to 740. And now three days later, we're getting to see the bilateral, the X-rays themselves are showing bilateral infiltrates. So he's got the lymphopenia, the bilateral infiltrates, uh, and the uh, uh, complaints typical of it, and consistent with his infection. Next, he was left on the, uh, the Plaquenil. Uh, day five, he has increasing infiltrates. Uh, his calcitonin starts rising and he's put on uh, antibiotics. Uh, and so he seemed like he was headed uh, in the wrong direction. All right, next slide. Let's talk about treatments, which is really the hot topic. So right now, there are uh, four meds that are discussed. And one is the hydroxychloroquine, which has been used for many years. It's called Plaquenil. It's a derivative of the drug chlor chloroquine, which we know is used for uh, malaria prophylaxis. And it's thought to be a, a, a potent antiviral agent. The way they feel that it's antiviral is two things. I'll show you on the next slide. But what, basically what happens is when the, the COVID virus binds to the, the pulmonary uh, lungs, the, the pulmonary uh, cells, it binds to what's called the ACE2 receptor. And when it binds to the ACE2 receptor, it is able to then fuse with the cell and it gets, put, it gets packaged in a thing called uh, uh, endospore, and, and in that endosome. Within that endosome, what happens is that the hydroxychloroquine seems to uh, change the pH and may inactivate the virus. Hydroxychloroquine is also thought to block the ability of the of the virus to bind to these cellular receptors. So even though it's a drug for malaria and rheumatoid arthritis, it seems to have antiviral activity by changing the endosome pH, which inactivates the virus, and also blocks the ability of the virus to, to bind to the cellular receptors. 
There's a drug called remdesivir, which Gilead has got a lot of attention for. And remdesivir is basically an RNA, it looks like an RNA uh, uh, molecule, and it gets incorporated into the replicating virus, but it's not a, a, it's not a function thing, it, it blocks the viral replication. So it, it's sort of a, a sneak thing, gets in there and blocks viral replication. However, it, there was so much demand for it, they're no longer uh, providing it to uh, anybody in Nevada unless they're under eight, 18 and the woman's pregnant. You have to uh, uh, get on a special study program, which we're trying to do. There was a drug called Calitra, which was an HIV drug which blocked the protease, so the enzymes involved in uh, making the virus active, but there was a study showing that it, it doesn't work and it's a toxic drug, so forget about it. And the other thing is that they're doing in Philadelphia and New York City is they're asking people who have had documented uh, COVID infections to come in. They're checking to make sure that they have high levels of antibody. They're then taking their plasma and infusing it into these patients. It worked well in the Ebola patients and hopefully it'll help uh, these patients too. So really the only one that's really available to us at this point is the hydroxychloroquine, also called Plaquenil. Next slide. So this is, I found on, this is a beautiful cartoon, even I can understand. So this is, this is the COVID virus, and it's coming up to the, the lung cells, and we have what we call the H2 receptor. So it's binding to these receptors, and there may be some inhibition of this by the hydroxychloroquine. And then once it binds, the, the, it, it forms a, a lipid uh, uh, endosome. So it basically gets incorporated and brought into the, into the, the pulmonary cell. And there's pHs here, is changed and it probably inactivates it. But if, it, if that's not going on, once it gets inside the, the pulmonary lung, it, it gets uncoded, and then you get the RNA. The RNA then starts replicating. It's got a, a polymerase, something that replicates it and makes more copies of it. And so this is where the drug remdesivir works. So we have these two spots are where hydroxychloroquine are supposed to work, and this is what remdesivir makes. And it blocks this replication of the virus so that it can then package itself up and then get released, all right? So this is the theoretical uh, role of these drugs. And, uh, but I said, the only one we really have is hydroxychloroquine. There were some studies on hydroxychloroquine and uh, it, there's a lot of questions of how it was done and they pulled out patients that didn't do well, but they seem to suggest that the PCR that uh, became undetectable in patients on hydroxychloroquine much quicker than those who are not. And so, they have uh, initiated the use of this drug. So let me show you the next slide. And so, which patients may benefit the most from antiviral therapy? And you know, if you're a young, healthy person, your risk of death is maybe one in a thousand. But when you start adding risk factors, you know, we older people have the highest of 15% death rate. So we really want to focus on the patients who are gonna benefit the most from the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine. Age greater than 60, hypertension, and diabetes is a particularly uh, risk factor uh, because it really increases the mortality significantly. And also morbid obesity, for whatever reason, seems to increase the risk factor. And immunosuppressed, just like we saw this patient I presented today, he was on Umera, he was on methotrexate, uh, besides the hydroxychloroquine, and he still got a pretty severe disease uh, despite that. Renal disease and heart failure, but particularly these are the, uh, the diabetics, the morbid obesity, and the older patient, and possibly hypertension, all significant risk factors. So we really wanna focus on helping these patients at this point uh, to prevent it from progressing. So whom we offer hydroxychloroquine to? And the most common reason COVID-19 patients are admitted is because they require supplemental oxygen. So there, everybody will have their own guidelines, but it seems like people are sort of, uh, for worsening around these guidelines. Any hospitalized patient who has a poor prognostic factor, like the six or seven we just talked about, that requires the use of oxygen initially or worsens clinically over the next 12 to 24 hours should be started on hydroxychloroquine. Anybody obviously in the ICU could get it. And you should avoid steroids unless there are other indications as well as non-steroids in these patients. The dosing of hydroxychloroquine is 400 milligrams twice a day for two day, for two doses, one day, and 200 milligrams BID for five more doses. Hydroxychloroquine uh, can prolong the QT prolongation, so you should be getting daily EKGs, and if they're in the hospital, you can put them on telemetry to monitor this. You gotta watch for medication interactions, monitor electrolytes, and if they're septic, 
or their procalcitonin is rising, think about using broad spectrum antibiotics for these patients. Be very careful about using azithromycin, uh, which a lot of people do, because it also has an additive effect on the QCC and the sudden death. And uh, so these things, uh, basically anybody who's hospitalized who has poor prognostic indication uh, and uh, requires the oxygen up to, all the way up to ICU is probably a candidate at this point uh, for, for this uh, uh, plaquenil regimen. Next. So just going back to the CDC guidelines, you know, the guidelines are, you know, hospitalized patients, uh, healthcare workers, et cetera. It's just, it's getting to the point what we need is more testing. And it's very frustrating. Uh, we don't have available uh, that we just test. Everybody needs to be tested. Okay, so, but anybody who's hospitalized, the recommended testing. Healthcare workers need to be testing. I think patients who have risk factors, you know, immunocompromised, elderly patients, where it's really important, uh, even if they're not admitted, to find out whether or not they, they have this disease because the risk factor is high. Possibly a young, healthy person of just a cough uh, would not be at the top of the line to get tested. Next. So, how do, you know, big question is coming, how do we, what do we do with healthcare workers who have potentially moderate, severe risk of infection after exposure to COVID-19 patients? And, you know, if, as I said, in a small hospital, one person could, could take out, you know, the, the nursing staff, the one doctor in the hospital, it would be a disaster. And we can't just put everybody on 14 days of uh, home quarantine and see what happens. Uh, so, well, these are not official guidelines. These are the things that we're start, we've been talking a lot about. And the recommendation, at least my recommendation, uh, I said these are not the official guidelines. So if somebody has a moderate to severe risk of infection, so you know they're, they're seeing the desk next to them, the person's been coughing for hours, that's a, a severe risk of infection. You'd want to quarantine these people for five to seven days. And if they get positive, you obtain a, a COVID-19 test. Uh, if they become asymptomatic, mostly people are going to convert to, to PCR positive within five to seven days. So if somebody is five to seven days, really has no symptoms at all, one option would be at that point to get a PCR test on these patients. If it's negative, allowing them to return to work wearing a mask and appropriate PPE for the rest of the 14-day period. If they develop symptoms during this period, then they need to be retested. And maybe you want to consider for less patient-intense work during that two-week period. So it's about five to seven days uh, that you're going to most likely develop PCR positive. And again, we just saw that people could be asymptomatic for a few days with the infection. So this would give us a, if they're negative five to seven days, likelihood is that they're not going to uh, get sick over those 14 days. If they develop any symptoms at any time after this exposure, uh, then you test a healthcare worker. And once the symptoms have resolved on these patients who are PCR positive, and they've got, they're not taking Motrin or Tylenol, they feel well, after 72 hours, the recommendation is that you get two PCR tests a day apart. So if somebody gets day, sick on day five, they're sick till day 10, uh, and uh, they feel fine. By day 13, they feel uh, back to normal. You then on day 14 and day 15, you wanna get two PCR tests, uh, and both negative may return to work. So uh, the thing is, by using this, uh, instead of just putting everybody on a blanket 14-day quarantine, uh, if, you, uh, if you're careful and the person's totally asymptomatic, maybe considering doing a PCR test at five to seven days after if it's negative, allowing them uh, to, come to the, come back to work. Uh, yes, next. I think that's everything, right? All right, so I think, you know, the last week we've learned a lot. One is that uh, uh, there's definitely asymptomatic carrier uh, patients who are either not aware of their symptoms uh, or have no symptoms or don't even know that uh, they can't smell as a symptom, that these people can definitely uh, are contagious. The CDC has nice documentation that this help is, is going to occur. So instead of asking people, I think it's important to ask people, are they coughing, sneezing, etc., cetera, uh, presume that if they do have those symptoms, send them home, but if they don't have any symptoms, it still may be worth putting on at least a uh, a surgical mask on every person uh, who comes into your facility. And we at the VA here actually have not only that, the front door, 
when we, when we have what's like a skilled nursing facility attached to this. So that place, we're actually checking temperature, we're having people wear gowns, and we're asking them again all their symptoms and making sure that they are extremely uh, uh, not at risk of being contagious. And I think that's great uh, because, you know, once you get into a skilled facility, you know, the death rate is just so high in these people with all these risk factors. It's just too bad. All right, so it's a scary business. What we really need is a rapid test that's available to everybody. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Kreiser. So we'll open it up right now for questions. There's been a number coming in through the chat box. I wanna address a couple things, some housekeeping items. Um, so we did record the session today. It does take us a little while to make these available. Uh, we have to add closed captioning to them before we can um, post them to our website. Um, but if you do want, do want to, a copy of those, you can reach out to us at projectecho at med.unr.edu. And once the recording's available, uh, we'll send that to you directly. So I'll send that email out through the chat box right now. So we'll turn it, we'll uh, get to some questions here and feel free to keep writing those in through the chat box uh, and we'll get to them as they come in. So um, seeing anecdotal evidence that treating these patients as having ARDS may not be appropriate in all cases as they often have high lung compliance. Any updates on uh, ventilator settings, recommendations for initial intubation and ventilation? I'm an ID doctor. I don't know squat about ventilators. Uh, thank you for the question. We'll, uh, Mordechai Levy here, the medical director. We'll, uh, I'll kind of uh, have to see if there's somebody in our community that can be here next week to kind of help answer that question. Yeah, yeah I can get somebody. We have some excellent uh, hospital, uh, pulmonary guys here. I, I think they'd love to do that. That'd be great. Um, not great data on chlor uh, chloroquine for other viruses in vivo. What is the thinking this will be much different for COVID? I think everybody just has their fingers crossed. Uh, as I said, these studies are, are, are poor quality. Uh, it's really more of this, uh, uh, the fact that the, the PCR uh, numbers seem to become negative uh, quicker with this is that people are hoping against hope that it helps and everybody wants to feel like they're doing something. Okay. Um, can anyone provide insight for a community clinic perspective on implementing testing for high-risk patients or employees? The state lab is reserving for hospitalized patients is the best place to send to Quest or LabCorp. Any feedback on turnaround time? I read in the newspaper yesterday that Quest was taking two weeks to run their test. By then the patient's either dead or better. Uh, they were just overwhelmed by uh, requests. Uh, I'm up in uh, northern Nevada, and our uh, our lab here is just remarkable in ter getting turnover within uh, the same day or within 24 hours. So we're we're real fortunate to have a, a great lab here, but it is very frustrating uh, for that reason. But even even lab course taken four to five days, so uh, those are not a panacea for us at all. And we do uh, hope to have Dr. Mark Pandori, the director for the Nevada State Public Health Lab, on with us next week. If you were here last week, you heard him talk a little bit about testing. Um, so we hope he'll join us again next week. And we can continue talking about that. Uh, azithromycin efficacy was not mentioned much here. Do we have any uh, evidence that it would help? Uh, all we know is that it prolongs the QT interval. Uh, there's really, that study was so poor that nobody really is, uh, going with that at all. I just think it's too risky to add, add it, the hydroxychloroquine. You just, you know, it's an unproven treatment and uh, is proven that QTC prolongations can kill the patient. So it would have to be used in the hospital with telemetry going on uh, before I would consider using it. Uh, Dr. Van Gilder shared that it's taking 10 days for COVID testing in Lovelock right now. Are they sending it out to uh, private labs? Um, Dr. Van Gilder, are you still on? Can I unmute you and you can share? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, so we have sent ours out to Quest. I know we just have another one that went out. Um, I'm not sure I was hoping our state health doctor would be on today, but um, yeah, we have, we're on day nine now of waiting for the one that we sent out. It was collected the 25th, it went out on the 26th, um, and still no results. So we're hoping for 10 days. Yeah, that's why this, yeah. 
that's why this country is in a disaster because we don't have this testing. I and mean, if we just had a testing, we would you'd be right on top of this stuff. It's be it's just unbelievably frustrating. It just it's crazy. Uh, and then, but you know, if somebody's sick enough to be in the hospital and they fit all the criteria, and you're going to have to wait eight, ten days, I would uh, start the uh, the hydroxychloroquine uh, on the assumption that they have it. Uh, the classic chest X-ray findings, the lymphopenia, uh, the symptoms at this point. Uh, I mean, you could do a flu test, but we've actually stopped doing flu tests or any other testing with these patients. I mean, if you want to rule out the flu, it's negative. They fit. I would probably just treat them, at least in the whole setting. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Very frustrating. Um, Dr. Krasner, do you have a source for the healthcare worker return to work guidelines? Uh, we've been discussing it, uh, and the uh, state. Uh, there's a, I'm a part of a COVID group, and I'm, we're hoping we get these recommendations out in the next few days. But it is not the CDC recommendation. The CDC, I think, is still as 14 days uh, for everybody. But I just think it's uh, it's not realistic for us, particularly for a small hospital where you lose all your doctors or uh, nurses. Yeah, so those are my recommendations, but it is being looked at the state level, and I hope that these guidelines are, are approved. Uh, you know, at least here in Northern Nevada, again, we're able to, uh, Dr. Pandori says we can go ahead and do these testing. It's five to seven days, he has the, he has the, uh, you know, the, the stuff to do it, so we're fortunate up here. Um, we're asked to screen people with mild respiratory symptoms, but no fever to see if they're safe to work in the mines. Without ability to test, I'm clearing them without fever or obvious infectious symptoms. What do you think? They need to go home. Uh, it's amazing. A lot of these patients don't have fever. Uh, some would just say, you know, the lack of smell, a uh, little cough. So uh, anybody who's not feeling 100% should not be in your hospital. So, Dr. Kratz, I just want to make sure the question was clear. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it sounds like this person is in charge of the mines, uh, and I guess their people are coming to work and they're screening them. Uh, do you think, I guess the question was, is his screening adequate for people coming to, to work uh, in the mines? Well, you have to trust people to tell you really their symptoms. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, at the VA here, we have a thing, uh, we're gonna be we, a clinic where we can send people to get tested uh, that have, have mild symptoms, but if you don't, if you have any symptoms, you know, myalgias, little cough, uh, even without a temperature, uh, they they should not come to your hospital. You just can't take the chance. But I, I, I again, I think if, if you can, uh, if you do it, I think everybody should be wearing uh, at least a, a a surgical mask in the hospital. Anybody's, even people who are not, I mean, you're you're not essential. I mean, they're essential, but not essential. They should be home. But anybody who needs to be in the hospital, they all should be wearing a mask, even if they're just, you know, a receptionist or something else like that. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is, if these people can have to be transmitting the disease. Okay. And that's also, we're doing at Renown too, and they, they put you through a, a, a big question, you know, lots of questions, but you must wear a mask uh, in the hospital. And I think that's the best thing to do. All right, so we are over time, but we're going to be here for a little while longer. There's a lot of questions coming in, uh, and I know, Dr. Krasner, you're, you're available to stay on for us a little bit here. Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, so any news about NSAIDs in COVID? Uh, the, uh, was it the New England Journal of Medicine just had a big thing. Uh, it's like uh, Dr. Fauci doesn't think it causes problems for various reasons. He, he does recommend Tylenol. There's actually a uh, New England Journal had a very complicated thing that I, I difficult to understanding, but the bottom line is that uh, talking about ACE inhibitors or ARB inhibitors, they actually may benefit, not negative uh, effect to you if you've been on it. It has to do with up and down regulation of the ACE receptor. But the bottom line is the recommendation, all the uh, hypertensive kidney uh, organizations throughout the country strongly recommend that people stay on ACE and ARB inhibitors. Do not, do not stop that treatment. And the non steroidals uh, it's not clear, but a Fauci recommends use of Tylenol for pain relief. Question, a uh, question from Mount Grant Hospital. 
patient with symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, tested negative for COVID, flu, rapid strep, uh, chest x-ray and labs were negative and unremarkable. Treated symptomatically, patient symptoms not improving after five to seven days. Do we retest for COVID? Uh, when I would, for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, is that your recommendation? I mean, how, how long after presenting uh, should they retest? The public health department says one to two days to repeat the test. Okay, they first want you to wait a day if you, for, after the onset of your symptoms. Uh, and then if that's negative, but you still have symptoms, repeat the test. They, they strongly believe that you should retest. I mean, unless the patient's just at home and there's nothing going on, but particularly in healthcare workers or people who are sick or things like that, where it makes a big difference uh, and you have the facilities to do the test. Um, given the mechanism, doesn't it seem uh, hydro... Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, hydrochloroquine uh, may be best as preventative rather than treatment. May be good to initiate treatment in high-risk patients without respiratory decline. Uh, my guy who got, I presented you today was on hydroxychloroquine for years, but he, he was also on Umira. Uh I think we first have to see, uh, I mean, it's something to look at, but at that point, you know, you would use up every single uh, hydroxychloroquine pill in the, in the country if you put everybody on, on prophylaxis. I think we have to first look at these mild cases and or, or with high risk factors. We got to save it for patients who, if it if it really works, is it going to benefit them the most. But if it does run that, that would be the next study. Uh, would be to look at high risk patients. Uh, you know, you got an obese diabetic patient. You'd want them on a prophylaxis med medicines while this endemic is going on. Just like you know, somebody exposed to the flu, you'd want to put them on Tamiflu uh, for prevention uh, until their vaccine can kick in. But it's just probably a, a it would be a billion pills a day used up. All right, uh, Mount Grant Hospital also shared the Nevada Department of Health return to work recommendations. Um, and there's one recommendation they're talking about specifically. Uh, do you agree that asymptomatic healthcare worker who's been exposed to positive COVID patients uh, should return to work without testing negative. All right, we just talked about that. So if you've had a, mild, a moderate to severe uh, risk for infection, uh, the, the, we have to stay out for two weeks, or uh, if you can, at days five to seven, uh, do a PCR test on those patients, okay? Because most of the people are gonna be PCR positive uh, by five to seven days, even though it'll be a few days before they develop symptoms. So that was the, the, the suggestion to get these people back to work quicker. If they're negative, five to seven days, have them come in you know, wearing a mask and stuff like that, uh, and just to self-monitor. That's the whole idea of getting these people back. Because if you don't do that test, they're, they're stuck at home for 14 days. But again, that's not the official policy yet, but it may be shortly. Okay. Um, Dr. Bayun, uh, state is encouraging to retest in hospitalized patients and encouraging non-test strategy for positive individuals. What's your take? It's it's shitty that we don't have uh, the test, okay? But uh, they're trying to just uh, save the save the uh, the test. Mm -hmm. uh, but non-hospitalized patients, uh, I would probably you know non-hospitalized patients that don't have risk factors probably can just you know a young person or a healthy middle-aged person, if they, as long as they're doing well at home, they should just stay at home. But you may want to consider it in patients who have, you know, multiple risk factors for, for decline and retesting them or testing them. A follow-up question uh, about the mine workers. So patient presents with allergic rhinitis symptoms, cough suspected from PND, uh, should they send them home? Again, you're gonna to have to see what their symptoms. It's just a runny nose. Uh, are they having myalgia, shortness of breath, or stuff like that? Uh, do they have a history of allergies? You just have to. Uh, but usually, sneezing and runny nose are not uh, initial presentation of this disease. Okay. Um, other than educating staff to get their information from valid sources, any other ideas for decreasing anxiety amongst healthcare workers? Uh, getting more testing available. It is, there's, how can you not be anxious? But you know, Fauci said, use that anxiety, that energy to a positive thing, maybe helping your neighbors or doing things, something positive, sewing a uh, mask or stuff like that. So he says, try, try to you know, funnel to something positive. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and if civilians have surgical masks at home, should they be wearing them out? I, uh, if I, I went to Walmart yesterday to see what it was like there, and not only did Walmart not have, uh, uh, what's it called, the alcohol for hand rubbing, they didn't even have, they were out of those swabs to, to the, uh, you know, to clean off the handles on those disgusting uh, carts. And then, you know, they say there's, they're, they're doing, what's it called, uh, space and social distancing, but they have everybody crowded together uh, in that little electric thing, you know, it, uh, automatically you, you pay your bills that way. So if you have a mask, uh, I would definitely, if you're gonna be in a situation like that, I would bring my own alcohol to clean the stuff and I would wear a mask and try to go when it's not too crowded. Gotcha, thanks Dr. Krasner. Um, what's your feeling on reusing PPE in the hospital setting? It's crazy that we don't have that stuff, but uh, I know we're looking at the VA and we're now using things like uh, uh, UV light and stuff like that to uh, clear it out, but you gotta do what you gotta do, unfortunately. Uh, they've, they've got different things, but nothing's perfect. Um, so surgical masks are limited in the hospital. What about homemade masks? Uh, homemade masks, actually the the residents and some of the physicians at Renown are using their N95 and then they're putting a homemade mask in front of it so that uh, uh, their masks aren't getting wet and then they're uh, in protected N95 mask. Okay. And also, if that's all you got at home is a, a you know, homemade mask, it's better than nothing. And so, I mean, it's really droplet stuff. So you wanna protect yourself from inhaling those droplets. Okay. Great questions, everybody. Any other questions uh, as we start to wrap up here for the day? Feel free to write those in or unmute yourself. You know, like uh, once you work in a hospital, then you start looking, you get much more attentive to what's going on. Like when you go to Walmart, see all these possible sources of infection or, you know, just uh, the door handles and stuff like that. So, whoa, I never gave it this much thought, but it, it really is uh, sort of scary. And if you make one mistake, who knows what's gonna happen. Not a happy, not a happy time. All yeah. right, thank you all. One more and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Have any studies been done to add ACE inhibitors to treatment regimen in patients without any contraindications? They, I don't understand why, if you're on an ACE inhibitor, you're supposed to stay on it because it can help. They do not recommend adding ACE inhibitors uh, if the patient's not been on it because it actually can make things worse or something. But. It's a very complicated topic which I don't understand, uh, but do not add an ACE inhibitor if somebody has this. But if somebody's on it, you definitely want to keep them on it. And if you uh, uh, read the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this week, there's a big discussion about uh, these angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and uh, if you can get through it, it explains everything uh, in uh, why, you, why you want to stay on it but not add it. Okay. All right, so we'll wrap up here for the day. I sent out the link. All right, you guys. I'll see you. We'll see you next week, right, Dr. Krasner? All right, so I sent out that link for you to claim. Um, and yeah, if I'm not on quarantine. <laughs> All right, um, so AMA, PRA, Category 1, or nursing credit, I sent out the link for that. Uh, here's our upcoming dates for this, this series. Um, so we're here weekly, 12.15 to 1 p.m. It'll be the same Zoom link and information that you use to join today. Um, so we hope you'll join us again, like I said, weekly. So we'll be back next Thursday and the Thursday after that and probably the Thursday after that. Keep it going here. So, um, and then I want to invite you to our other uh, Project Echo clinics. We are going to have a special cardiology session next week, um, part of our ongoing cardiology series. Um, but uh, New uh, UNR Med faculty member, Dr. Laurel Toft, is gonna to be talking about cardiovascular involvement with COVID-19 infection. So that one's gonna be on Tuesday, April 7th, 12 to one. Again, same Zoom, Zoom link that you used to join today. Um, so we hope you'll join us then. Uh, Dr. Levy, did you have some other announcements? Yeah, just one other announcement, thank you, Troy. Um, just uh, wanted to kind of invite everybody that's here to our kind of Project Echo Nevada orientation that we're holding uh, on Tuesday the 7th, we'll be talking about COVID, um, but if you just kind of want to learn about how long Dr. Krasner has been doing this antibiotic stewardship echo and all of our other programs and 
and how we structure our clinics, I, I strongly encourage you all to attend. Uh, I included the, the link in the, the chat box if you guys want to click on it, um, but just wanted to make sure everybody knew that was an, uh, a resource for you too. But good to see everybody. Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, Dr. Levy. So yeah, if you need to claim your credit, go to that CME uh, evaluation link, then, and then if you'd like to join our orientation to learn more about Project ECHO, you can register online through that other link we sent. So thanks so much, everybody. We hope you'll join us at more of our ECHO clinics, and of course, these ones um, each week, again, Thursdays at 1215. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day.